Hello, my name is Ria Tregovov, and I'm honored to be reading Nancy Richler's story, Life's Promise. The dedication is written for my mother on her 63rd birthday. Our great grandmother was how we weren't supposed to turn out. Two of our aunts told us, nodding gravely over tea, one Rosh Hashanah. It was this time of year, Aunt Millie began, right after the harvest. The harvest is earlier in Russia, don't forget, Aunt Bertha continued. It's not earlier, Aunt Ruth called from across the room. What do you know about the harvest anyway? What, your farmers now? Ruth was the oldest. She argued with everyone. So the harvest was in, Millie went on. The one time of year their bellies were full. Not that it was an easy time of year, Bertha continued. Times were never easy over there. Of course not. I wasn't saying it was an easy time of year, just that for once the children weren't crying from hunger. She had the strength after a day of work to take a short walk. If it had been such a short walk, she may have lived to raise her children, Bertha murmured. Millie sighed and patted her moist face with the tissue. So she took a short walk, our cousin Mandy prodded. She already knew this story. All our older cousins did. To the edge of the forest, Millie continued. The village was surrounded by a forest. Forest like you've never seen, added Bertha. Never dreamed about, said Millie. What they call a forest here, there they would call a few trees. They both paused to sip at their tea. Millie reached for more honey cake. Bertha tapped at her hand. So then what happened, I asked. So then, instead of just walking to the edge of the village, and stopping to admire the forest, she continued walking. Into the forest, I asked. She just walked right into the forest. They both nodded. And then, and then nobody knows. What was she doing or where she was when the wolves got her? We don't know. The wolves? Wolves got her? They nodded again. I glanced at my other sister, Sarah. She'd already told me about the wolves who lived under the stairs. Don't believe them, Ruth called from across the room. Two old maids with nothing better to do than make up stories. It's not a story, Millie hissed. Did they ever find her bones, Ruth asked? No, they never found her bones. You think wolves eat bones now? In a forest so huge, they're going to find the bones of one woman and such a small woman? Fair. Bertha waved her hand dismissively at Ruth. Maybe in Russia, wolves need bones, I ventured, shuddering in terrified delight. Maybe, Millie agreed. Why did she go into the forest when there were wolves there, Sarah asked. Our own mother passing through the room with a fresh pot of tea interrupted at this point. That's enough now, she told her sisters. Nobody knows what really happened to your great-grandmother, she told us. Bertha and Millie didn't argue with their mother. They never did. After she left, they swore it was because they had always suspected their grandmother's spirit had resurfaced in her. Not that our mother got eaten by wolves. There were no wolves roaming around the streets of Montreal in the 60s eating stray women, not as far as I knew. Had there been though, who knows what might have happened because she did stray. And like her grandmother, she didn't return. Sophie was always different, Millie said about her at another family gathering after she'd already left us. Wild. She was always wild, even as a little girl, Aunt Millie contributed. What wild, Ruth joined in. Sophie was quiet, very quiet, but curious too. Too curious. 
She was a painter. She would sit for hours in front of a window, a wall, a bowl of fruit, and create fields of color and texture that looked nothing like anything any of us had ever seen before. Your mother's eyes are different from ours, our father told us once before she left. When friends and relatives claim not to understand her work, she just shrugged. I never knew what there was to understand or not to understand. Anyone sitting or standing in the same room as her huge sunlight too could feel the oozy heat of July reaching to envelop them. No one who had seen sunlight one would ever be able to go outside in early June light and not see the dance of colors in the air. It's too complicated for me, the rabbi said, but she's not hurting anyone and it keeps her out of trouble, he added, winking at my father. My father didn't wink back. Before she left, I thought she was just different from other mothers, more like us kids, more fun, when she wasn't too busy painting or thinking about something that is. I didn't know about her kind of difference in our kind of world. There were clues, of course, just none I noticed. Everyone could see she was the only married woman who didn't cover her hair with a hat or a kerchief although sometimes she wore a baseball cap until Aunt Ruth told her to stop. And she was probably the only mother who never managed to get the candles lit on time on Friday nights. Friends and relatives sometimes made comments, which she ignored. So I did too. Our father was no help at all in this regard. He loved our mother after all and continued to love her even after she left. He seemed to see nothing abhorrent in her behavior. He said it was all too easy to condemn what we can't understand. And that was his final word on the matter, or almost his final word. When Sarah or I would try to get him to admit what he must know about her, what everyone knew about her, he'd sometimes say that Everyone had to find their own way to life's promise. He had this thing about life's promise. He obviously wasn't quite right himself. For one thing, he never complained about his work the way the other fathers did. Not even a tired sigh at the end of the day. He sold fruit for a living and seemed to think this was the highest calling possible. He didn't talk to us much either, not with words. He could be embarrassing, like he'd make the blessing over the first pomegranate in the season. Pomegranates were his favorite food, fruit. He'd bring home the ripest, richest one, make the blessing and slice it open. Then he'd slice it again into quarters and eight crimson juice spilling onto the table. He'd hold it up to us then, as if it were the most precious item in creation. His point was anybody's guess. It probably had to do with life's promise. Most things did. Or it could have just been the beauty of the pomegranate. Like our mother, he'd been born in Russia, but he hadn't come to Canada until after the war. His unwavering belief in life's promise seems one of the small miracles of our childhood. At the time, though, it was just another example of our abnormality. Other parents lived their lives regularly. Ours had to go sniffing around for some promise we didn't know for sure anyone had ever made. Lucky for us, our father's way to life's promise didn't involve making a public spectacle of himself and us. In his view, it lay in the dailiness of life. Wives had left husbands before, mothers had left children. 
in the meantime, there was still work to be done, meals to be cooked and enjoyed, lessons to be learned, prayers to be spoken and sung. Life is to be lived, not mourned, he said in a wordy moment not, not long after our mother left. And we should never forget we have plenty to thank God for. Like what, challenged Sarah, not feeling at all thankful. For one thing, he answered promptly, we can thank him that we don't lack for helping hands. There was no disputing that. We had our mother's six sisters and their family. None of our father's eight brothers and sisters had survived the war, as well as the community around us eager to share in our misfortune. So we lived and went to school and Sarah and I began, began to look and act more like our friends. Over time, we even gained a bit of a reputation, the good kind, for how well we took care of our house, our father, and our younger brother, Jonathan. It began to seem like maybe our great grandmother's spirit really had resurfaced in our mother and departed our family when she did. Probably no one was fooled but me. Jews have notoriously long memories and our mothers, if not our great grandmothers, behavior was never far from anybody's mind. Certainly not Mrs. Horowitz's when she wished us good Shabbos that time, several years after our mother left. Good Shabbos, David, she said to her father, and good Shabbos, Sarah and Anne, she said, kissing her cheeks. You're both looking lovely, she added, looking us up and down. How old are you now? She asked. I could tell she had some Sammy in mind for Sarah. At the time, I still thought this was what we should be hoping for. I'm 16 and Annie's 14, Sarah answered. Such beauties, Mrs. Horowitz said to her father, like pearls, two beautiful pearls, she murmured and went on her way. You know what pearls are, Sarah commented on the walk home. Of course I did. Beautiful jewels, I said, still glowing from the compliment. Oh, right, Sarah giggled, with dirt in the middle. They start out as an irritation to an oyster. Did you know that? A piece of schmutz right at the core. Oysters aren't kosher, Yonatan contributed. I should have known then, but still I didn't. I continued to try for years in the best way I knew how. But spirits like our great grandmothers, it seems, aren't so easily put to rest. They can't leave well enough alone and beckon teasingly from the murky unknowns they inhabit. It was at Yonatan's engagement party that it finally began to dawn. I had flown in from Utah where I'd been living for two years, climbing and photographing canyons. Sarah had decided not to come to Montreal for the occasion. She was preparing an important court case in Toronto. Had she not been busy, she probably wouldn't have come in anyway. The community's charm is lost on me, she told me before she left for Toronto. And she'd not been back more than once or twice in the eight years since. Sarah wasn't the type to be haunted by nostalgia. The ants had gathered at my father's house to toast Yoni and his bride-to-be. A long letter had arrived from our mother, wishing Yonatan a life of love and happiness, and telling us about her most recent show, A Modest Success, and about the home she'd made for herself in Portugal. Something about the light there, I'm sure. Her sisters began discussing her with the usual mixture of awe and anger. Many described something our mother had done some 40 years earlier, proof positive she'd always been wild. They said she'd never been wild. Different, yes, discontent, maybe, but never wild. Bertha waved her hand about in excitement. Wild, smiled, she said. She just had no respect for tradition. You tell me what woman 
with an ounce of respect, would name her daughter after a woman who was eaten by wolves. Tell me that. And don't give me that it was her grandmother's name. She wasn't eaten by wolves, Ruth maintained. We, oui, I interrupted. Which daughter? Which daughter what, Ruth asked, impatient to get back to the argument about their grandmother's demise, this still their favorite topic. Which daughter was named for her, me or Sarah? Both of you, you're both named for her. Hannah Sarah was her name, you know that. And she turned back to her sisters. She was not eaten by wolves. I happen to know that for a fact. She paused for effect as if we all didn't know what came next. I happen to know for a fact that she was chased through the forest by a pack of dogs and died of fright. We sat back satisfied with her contribution and reached for another piece of sponge cake. Voices rose and crackled around me as the argument ensued. It wasn't a huge thing for the ants to have let slip all these years later. It wasn't going to change my life or Sarah's to know we'd been named for her. Still, as the plane circled and descended on the red eroding earth, I was now calling home. I thought about my mother entrusting us, her daughters, with such a restless, unwieldy soul, dividing the burden to lighten the load. I drove to my home and felt the hot, endless space open around me. My life, which I'd believed unbound, severed from all I'd been taught to hold close, felt suddenly my own, and deeply rooted in the past and living hopes, dreams, and spirits I had yet to discover.